instead of the elevator going up, it stopped at the basement. The doors opened to reveal a horrifying scene out of time and reason. Join us as we enroll at the nation's most haunted campuses and take a tour of the prestigious Notre Dame University, where a famous football legend is sick of the spotlight. He's bad. He's real bad. He'll, he'll scare you to make you want to run out of the building. And in New England, a student killed herself in her dorm room. Fifty years later, she's still searching for a roommate. As the story goes, she left in the middle of the night, raving, seal it, seal it, rip down the walls. And in this Florida art school, students need more than their room key to keep this spirit out. You see a skeletal figure floating in the air above you, that's pretty scary. Come along as we visit the country's most studious specters where higher education has never reached such terrifying heights. Going to college can be a pretty scary affair. New people to meet, teachers to impress, and all that academic pressure. You spend so much time worrying about what you want to do when you grow up. But choose a campus haunted by ghosts, and you can forget about the books. Instead, you'll find yourself with a double major in life and death. The University of Notre Dame is a school full of history and tradition. And football is as much a part of Notre Dame as its books and basilica. Every Notre Dame football fan swells with pride when they hear these legendary five words. Win one for the Gipper. Win one for the Gipper. And win one for the Gipper. The Gipper was Notre Dame football star George Gipp, who in 1920 died after a bout with pneumonia. On his deathbed, the 25-year-old Gipper told his coach, Newt Rockney, his one and only dying wish. When the boys are up against it, when the brakes are not going their way, you tell them to go out and give their all and win one for the Gipper. And I don't know where I'll be, Rock, but I'll know and I'll be happy. Eight years after the Gipper's death, things were looking bleak for Notre Dame during a game against their arch-rival, Army. For the first time, Coach Rockney spoke those famous words. He told them, this is that day, and you are that team. And they went out and they won the game. Notre Dame beat Army that day 12 to 6, solidifying the Gipper's legend at Notre Dame. And 90 years later, his name still echoes through the school's halls. Only this time, his legend has nothing to do with football. He's, he's bad. He's real bad. He'll, he'll scare you to make you want to run out of the building. Notre Dame is located in South Bend, Indiana, and was founded by Catholic priests in 1842. Today, the campus has grown from five buildings to 136, with a new athletic facility soon to come. But legend tells us that the brotherhood that built Notre Dame had more in mind than just creating a beautiful campus. The buildings are grouped based on theories of sacred geometry. The ancient churches of Europe usually were astronomically oriented, and there is what is called an Apollo St. Michael line that goes all across Europe into Asia, Asia Minor, that, that comes very close to what we have here. Like the pyramids in Egypt and Stonehenge in England, the location of the campus is meant to harness a divine power. Is there energy there? All you have to do is just take a dowsing rod and you can feel it and know it and see it on occasion. Students and visitors feel it when they come here. They can't explain why, but they feel it. And there's one building on campus that sits on the hot spot of this energy. The energy line here goes right through the high altar of, of our basilica. And in the last two years, we've had two levitations I know of. Students at Notre Dame know their college experience will be like no other, but most have no idea of the powers their campus really holds. I'm positive that the builders, the early community, knew of this energy. 
they were creating something on earth that in the best of their ability reflects God's designs. This mystique attracts 8,000 undergrads and 3,000 grad students, most of whom find it hard not to get caught up in Notre Dame school spirit. It's incredible. Inside the locker room, you know, there's plaques of all the Heisman Trophy winners, and you're surrounded by history everywhere you turn. It's hard to put in the words, but when you're out on that field for the first time and you kind of, you know, hear the crowd, you know, cheering as you come run out the tunnel, uh, it's just an unbelievable experience. At Notre Dame, some say football is like a religion, and George Gipp is their god. Gipper was notorious, great football player, notorious for uh, his escapades in town uh, in the evenings. Well, he was a very uh, interesting individual, is the way I would put it. He, uh, he was kind of a laid-back guy. He was almost shy, but yet he enjoyed uh, playing poker. He enjoyed shooting pool. He enjoyed the good life. I'm sure he had a few drinks from time to time. Legend says George Gipps' wild streak would soon cut his career and life short. And he came back after curfew one night, so he couldn't get in. And he slept out on the steps, and it was really cold and rainy, so he caught pneumonia, and he died. So that's why they say that he haunts this place. Students passing Washington Hall late at night walk a little faster. But those who work there have no choice but to face its haunting past. And one employee had an encounter she'll never forget. The lights were off other than the um, ghost light on the stage. And he come up onto the stage in front of me. And I reached out and I put my hand through him. Locked out in life, it seems the Gipper isn't leaving in death. It was just a weird, creepy feeling. And then you felt the cold draft. And then he left. While night staff are used to his presence, about 20 years ago, a group of theater students wanted to put the legend of the Gipper to the test. In 1986, a group of students came back in the building after hours and used a Ouija board and asked it um, about the ghost. The night started off all in good fun until a cryptic message began to appear. And they repeatedly kept saying SG and telling them goodbye. The students left frightened and confused, but it didn't take long for them to figure it out. When they left, they saw a light come on in the green room from outside, and they looked back at the building and a security guard came outside. And so they knew that the ghost was kind of telling them to get out of the building. It seems the Gipper was warning the students that they were about to get caught by security, and they got away just in time. Today, a group of Notre Dame students wants to recreate history, hoping to summon the spirit of George Gipp and prove that the strange noises they hear in the middle of the night aren't so strange after all. I just thought it'd be really neat just to see if there really are any ghosts here, because there's always like really eerie feelings around here in certain areas, and um, there's so many stories. But do these students know what they're in for? I kind of want something major to happen, but then at the same time, I don't. It would be a little scary, but I hope we find something. I have no idea what's going to happen tonight, um, but I think that it's going to be exciting. And I think that it's going to be uh, something that we're either going to totally feel or not at all. Okay, well, everyone needs to put their fingers on there, just lightly, though. You don't want to put a lot of pressure on there, and we'll see if we can contact anybody. Okay. Are there any spirits here that want to talk to us? Will you tell us your name? Do you stay anywhere else on campus? No. Did you die here?
Was it the ghost of George Gipp? Perhaps Notre Dame's divine energy, or just a student's overactive imagination? There's so much about Notre Dame that's storytelling, and that's what all the other stories are about too, wanting to be back at Notre Dame, wanting to be here for you know another semester, another year, another four years. Like so many of Notre Dame's students, it seems the Gipper just wasn't ready to graduate. in the basement of Pennsylvania Hall at Gettysburg College are the only ghosts that have been spotted on the old campus. Since the war, each graduating class has had its share of ghost stories to tell. I think it probably is haunted. In fact, one of um, the people in one of my classes constantly comes in and she tells us stories of things that happened to her in her house. All of the, the quads here were actually burial grounds for soldiers, so every time I walk over them at night, I think about it, and I mean, it just gives you an eerie feeling when you walk across campus really late sometimes. There is a persistent sighting of a sentry or a guard, uh, or some call them a signalman up in the cupola of Old Dorm. The rumor goes that uh, Robert E. Lee used the cupola for a while as uh, a lookout post. We we're not sure whether he did or not, but it certainly makes sense that he would be up there since it was the... I interviewed one of the people firsthand who had the experience, and one of my students that I worked with very closely saw it himself. I believe him if he said it, and he knows of another person who did, and there was at least one other time where someone was interviewed for a paper in my class. The person saw the same thing, essentially, on, on the cupola. The campus theater also has a history of ghost activity. There's a story that comes from uh, Clyde Theater. And the story is that there is a certain officer, general officer dressed in a Confederate uniform, who appears on certain nights. He was seen by a couple of uh, stagehands. They were preparing the stage. There was a chair in the middle of the stage. One stagehand was up on uh, a ladder. Another one had just walked onto the stage. And the one on the ladder looked down and happened to see in the empty chair, the general sitting there called to the other one as the other one turned and got a glimpse of him. The general disappeared. Ghost sightings have been reported in many other buildings on campus. <laughs> Back at Stevens Hall, the Blue Boy isn't the only unannounced visitor to the girls' dorm. There are numerous reports of the sighting of a young girl in some of the rooms who doesn't really belong there. She seems to be interested in the clothing of uh, modern day women who uh, inhabit Stevens at this time. The women come back from a late night date, open the door to their room, and they see a young girl standing there. Hey, what are you doing? The woman ran into the closet after her and couldn't find no intruder, no young woman in the closet, and no route of escape from that closet. Off campus, another resident of Gettysburg who had a the encounter was a woman who worked late at night typing papers for college professors. Her poltergeist encounter ran the full spectrum of ghostly communication. Ghosts seem to be able to communicate on not just a visual level, but uh, an auditory level on a uh, olfactory level. Uh, and a tactile level as well. 
So there are many different uh, manifestations of ghosts. The woman had never felt comfortable since moving into a huge old house located on Broadway. One night, she found out why. I began to have these feelings that something was wrong. I just didn't feel that we were alone in the house, that I felt uh, another presence there. I started feeling a sensation that uh, someone was behind me, you know, how you feel when someone's standing behind you. And I turned around and nobody was there. And I thought, this is strange. Besides the feeling that something was watching her, she was also overcome by the sensation that she was sitting in the middle of a cold spot, a phenomenon that often accompanies ghost sightings. It's a chill that you cannot explain. I mean, no amount of cold weather has ever given me this type of chill. I've never had a cold from, say, snow or anything like that to chill the very core of me. And this chill does, it, it goes right through me. Cold spots are very interesting. I found that all of the people who had a feeling of cold had the feeling of cold before the apparition occurred. Most people, if you ask them, would assume that you feel cold because you're scared, scared by the ghost. But in all of my cases, people got cold first and then had the apparition. Most of all, though, there lingered the feeling that she was not alone feeling persisted, just this overbearing feeling that something was behind me. And again, I turned around. At one point I got up, walked out into the next room. I felt more and more ill at ease that something was there. Something was wanting me out of the family room, or at least off the bottom floor, off the first floor of the house. The fear became really intense. Still, there was always the possibility that her mind was playing games with her. She had a job to do and a pressing deadline, so she decided to go back to work. Being haunted was not the first thing that came to mind when she tried to figure out what was happening. But finally, the feeling became too much. I felt that whatever it was just wanted me out of the way, so I accommodated it. And I left. I just felt that I needed to get upstairs right away. I stopped and looked back toward the library, and when I did, I saw this large column of blue light coming from the family room that I had just left. It was just long, symmetrical, glowing blue light. Well, needless to say, I didn't stay long in that spot. I mean, I don't even remember making it up the rest of the, the stairs at night. The incident profoundly scared and confused her, but not enough to drive her from the house. She's probably wondering if this is really happening and if she should give it full attention. It's a, it's a difficult thing to decide. I don't think she was necessarily entirely freaked out about the situation. She was concerned. She was upset at a particular moment. And, but she would decide to just leave, run away, go upstairs, and it would go away. I think it's, she didn't think it was that serious that she had to leave. Within days, she returned to her nocturnal work habits. But now she also observed the light patterns made by cars passing the house, believing there must be some rational reason for the mysterious blue light. I would stand late at night after I turn out the lights and wait for a car to come by to turn the corner to come down in front of the house to see if lights from the street would cast this light in the library. And never once did I ever see a car light cast the same shadow or the same light in the room. Still, she began to experience the same sensations as before the chilling cold spots, and the intense feeling that she was not alone. Also on this night, came the sounds. I started hearing sounds coming from the library of papers being rattled around. It sounded like someone was going through my husband's desk. When the noises started getting uh, much worse, much louder, more intense. And when once I got up enough nerve 
I got up and went in to check it out. Of course, nothing was there. I went back to my typing and was trying to overcome the fear that I had of what I had just seen. Almost immediately, the noises in the other room started up again. She decided that was it. She wasn't going to work anymore. She started going up the stairs and paused just for a second to look around to see if maybe her eyes weren't playing tricks on her. And the blue column was there. Not only was it standing in the doorway, but as she paused, it started moving out of the doorway and towards her. It was to say she sprinted up the rest of the stairs. And this shook her up for a while because she didn't go back to her late night work for uh, several nights. Although frightening, these strange encounters were also intriguing and they began to tap into something the ghost may not have expected in the woman. Grit and determination. For she decided not to be run out of her own house by the apparition. I couldn't give in to it. And more than that, I wasn't going to allow anything that I couldn't see scare me from living my life the way I wanted to live. Having failed to scare her away, the ghost saved its greatest performance for last. I had to stop and look over my shoulder again. And there in the doorway was the blue column of light. And in the column of light was the distinct features of me. All in all, I thought he was quite handsome, he was quite dashing. But yet at the same time, it scared the dickens out of me. He had this puzzled expression on his face as if he was saying why aren't you leaving it was like why are you still here this is my house get out out it sounds like an exorcist i don't know how to take this exactly it could be that she just somehow made the the spirit feel that it wasn't worth the conflict she was arguing back she had dealt with the trauma and it wouldn't occur to her again there's something in me that says sometimes if you can put a face to your fear we'll help you to overcome it there's no doubt in my mind that what i experienced in that house was something paranormal what i experienced was real what we call gettysburg college uh, today was once known as pennsylvania college and it was much much smaller than it is today there were only three buildings uh, on the pennsylvania college campus there was uh Linnean hall there was a building called the White House and a very, very large edifice called Old Dorm, today called Pennsylvania Hall. The fighting occurred just a few hundred yards to the north of the college campus. That meant that any structure back there was immediately confiscated by the surgeons and used as hospitals. Every single structure was filled overflowing with the wounded uh, refuse of the battle. Old Dorm, being one of the largest structures in the area, was also filled to overflowing. The lower floors they used mostly for the operating rooms, the upper floors for the recovery rooms. It's July, it's hot. Uh, the lower floors uh, soon became, became sticky with gore and, and the heat and the sweat of uh, wounded men. Amputations were a common thing and to throw the bone out the window or bones out the window on both sides or doors or whatever, or where they carried them out in baskets or however they did it, you know, the old belief that the National Cemetery is the only place that anybody was buried during the Battle of Gettysburg, I think, is fictitious. As these people were dumping stuff, they weren't carrying them out other places and being real cautious and careful as they might be today at a hospital or something like that. I believe if they dug the areas, and I'm certainly not 
advocating come dig on my campus because you, you will be arrested if you do that. Um, but I believe if they dug down, they'd probably run tons of artifacts, and probably some bones, and it's a, it'd probably be pretty amazing when all they'd run into because it's been there for so long. Old Norm now is uh, the administration building for Gettysburg College. And uh, the people over there are hardworking individuals. They work sometimes late, late into the night. And um, two administrators were working late one night and uh, decided finally that they were exhausted and decided to wrap it up. So they walked down the hall together to the elevator, the same elevator they had taken hundreds of times before, uh, down to the exit on the first floor. They got in the elevator, pushed the button for the first floor, and the elevator descended three, two, one, and then continued past the first floor down to the basement. Little did they know that the elevator was taking them to a special haunting, courtesy of the ghosts of Gettysburg. Of course, they assumed that this the elevator was acting up, and so they punched the button for the first floor again. But instead of the elevator going up, it stopped at the basement. The doors opened to reveal a horrifying scene out of time and reason. Instead of the cleaned up area that they had uh, seen so many, many times before, uh, that was a storage area in the basement, the doors opened to reveal a Civil War hospital scene. Amputations going on, orderlies walking around, carrying armloads of severed limbs, surgeons working and sweating in this man-made hell. Wounded soldiers writhing in the corner, waiting to be operated on. Um, other people agony in the far reaches of this area. The women uh, almost panicked. They, the scene was just so unbelievable and, and incredible to them. They punched frantically at the buttons, uh, trying to punch the first floor button to get them out of this. One of the surgeons looked up from the from the grisly task before him and beckoned to them, beseeching me to come in and help with this never-ending ordeal that he'd been going through for 120 years. And of course, to enter this scene was the last thing they wanted to do. All they wanted to do was leave. They punched frantically at the buttons again, and finally, slowly, the doors began to close, and the elevator took them back to the first floor. One of the women immediately reported the incident to campus security. Something had frightened her because she obviously, just by her emotions and her mannerisms, was scared, literally scared to death. The individual making the report was an administrator for the college, a person that I had known prior to the incident and after the incident, always pretty level-headed, very normal. We went over and the elevator was fine, the mechanisms in the elevator was fine. There was nothing in the basement. We checked the building to make sure it wasn't a college prank. There was no indication of any kind of outside entry. Anything unusual that would warrant thinking that this was somebody that had made up the story just for attention. I think people are frightened of ghosts because it's the unknown. Suddenly you're confronted with a situation you've never been in before, and uh, certainly uh, something like a, an apparition uh, that shouldn't be there or appears to be in the wrong place at the wrong time is going to frighten us. It certainly would frighten me. Once a small teaching school, the campus is now home to some 20,000 students from across the globe. The first building of what was then called Illinois State Normal University opened on the campus in 1861. Known as Old Main, the domed building would be a landmark for almost 100 years. In 1946, the um, dome and the third floor had to be removed because they were deemed to be unsafe. And then in 1958, the rest of Old Main had to be torn down. But closing the earliest chapter of the university's history would only reopen its past. 
and some say awaken dormant spirits within. Nelson Smith, the school's photographer, was on hand for the demolition and took dozens of pictures, one of which would prove truly unforgettable. When he was looking at the negatives, realized that he had caught an instant in which the collapsing bricks, mortar, dust, and everything had formed the shape of uh, a silhouette of Abraham Lincoln's face. The resemblance is eerie, but what does Abraham Lincoln have to do with Old Maine? Because he was the person who drew up the papers, he was the attorney for the university, we've looked at that photograph and thought to ourselves that was Abraham Lincoln's spirit perhaps manifesting itself at this moment that the original building on campus was demolished. Abraham Lincoln may be the most famous fright to appear out of thin air at ISU, but he is certainly not the most infamous. That distinction goes to another alleged apparition, one that continues to make its presence felt among students and faculty. I was terrified of the stacks. It's got a presence, I said, I guess. The stacks are located in ISU's Milner Library, named after its ghostly former librarian, Angie Milner. We're standing in front of Milner Library that was built in 1940. This is the building that was named for Angie Milner. She was our first full-time paid librarian at Illinois State Normal University. And this is the place where she is said to haunt the staff. And while a ghostly librarian may not seem scary, Students studying in the library late at night make sure they are not alone. It's sort of hard because I was a skeptic and the only thing that made me believe was actually seeing it. By day, the stacks seem harmless. But at night, students and employees have heard strange footsteps. Books are moved from shelf to shelf. And most frightening of all, a chilling shush from the ghost of the late librarian. This is the hallway here where Sarah saw the ghost of Angie Milner. And that's also the direction from which the sound of the footsteps was coming. I have had several experiences feeling Angie Milner's presence when I've been in the library. Is the ghost of Angie Milner lurking in the cramped shadows of the library? And if so, why? As the school's first librarian, Angie Milner built and organized the library's collection from scratch. This library was cataloged in her own handwriting for probably the first 10 years that the library existed. It was Angie's hands-on approach that helps explain her lingering devotion to her work. This is one of the books from the section that she was finished, had just finished cataloging when she, when she passed away. And this here at the bottom is her handwriting. Angie Milner was more than just a librarian. She embodied the spirit of the school. Known for her dedication, hard work, and community spirit, she never retired from her position, working up until the day before she passed away. That was Friday the 13th, 1928. The entire university was closed for her on-campus funeral. She was very attached to the books. She felt uh, personal ownership of those books, and she took excellent care of them. One day before her death, Angie Milner was cataloging and shelving biology books. These books, more than any others, seem to have a mind of their own. Over in the back section of the stacks, uh, the librarian and one of her colleagues were, they were discussing about moving the books to a different location. And at that point, the books started falling off one by one. But even more disconcerting than how the books fell off the shelves is how they landed. The book usually lands like that. And if you try to do that, 
by just pulling a book off of the shelf, especially from this height, it won't do it. You can't do it. It always falls over. Books aren't the only objects the ghost is reported to move at will. Before every Halloween, the librarians at Illinois State University bring tours into the haunted stacks. On this particular night, they got something else entirely, a genuine scare. A chair reserved for Angie's section of the stacks was seen quickly moving down the length of the aisle as if someone or something was moving it. If you try to roll the chair, give it a push, hardest push as you want, it always goes to the left. It won't ever go straight. But in this particular instance, it went all the way down the entire aisle. Recently, students doing a research paper on Angie's ghost brought a medium with them to try to contact her. And we found one spot kind of in like the middle aisle and we stood there and was pretty sure that she was across from us. After making contact, Angie's spirit asked why they were there. But before the medium could answer, one student saw Angie appear and disappear before her very eyes. I just sort of appeared in the aisle and just sort of went through the books. And then she was gone. It may be for the best that Illinois State University wow. dropped the word normal from its name. And while the idyllic campus is certainly a nice place to visit, just be sure to return your library books on time. The librarians at ISU are dead serious about their work. Welcome to Sarasota, Florida, home of warm beaches, bikinis, and the circus. Believe it or not, the vacation destination of Sarasota owes much of its history to the Ringling Brothers Circus. But it's another Ringling building whose history is far more bizarre than the Big Top. Ringling School of Art and Design attracts an eclectic mix of art students. These creative types can major in computer animation, graphic and web design, illustration, photography, and much more. But you won't find hauntings listed in the course book. It seems at Ringling, ghost sightings are strictly extracurricular. You see a skeletal figure floating in the air above you, that's pretty scary. I didn't believe it until I saw that, saw her that night. It was kind of a, an eye catching experience and a life changing experience. Ringling's resident ghost dates back to the 1920s. Students call her Mary, and many believe life wasn't kind to this depressed and aging prostitute. This is actually a picture I took in the hallway of um, what I believe could be Mary. I don't know what it was. It was scary, whatever it was. Call it what you will. Maybe I was, you know, hallucinating, maybe I was dreaming, but I don't know. I heard a lot of ghost stories from here and this close to the room where it happened, uh, I don't know what to think. So how did a prostitute's apartment become an art school? It all started when circus celebrity John Ringling came to town with dreams of building a school of art and design. He not only was interested, obviously, in the circus, but he's also very interested in art. And so he collected art, and his dream was actually to build a museum, a major museum, and have an art school that would be part of that museum. In the late 1920s, Ringling bought an old hotel, he soon converted the hotel into Ringling School of Art and Design's first campus building. Little did he know, the building's unsavory past would find a way of catching up with the present. Legend has it the hotel was home to the seedier side of Sarasota, and it was here where Mary lived and worked. While the city's wealthy residents were enjoying the last days before the Great Depression, Mary was in a depression of her own. A life in the shadows was too much for her to handle. On a fateful night, Mary decided she couldn't take another day of her meaningless existence. She hung herself in the staircase between the second and third floor of the building. 
But Mary's story wasn't over. In fact, it was only just beginning. <laughs> Today, the old hotel is a dormitory known as the Keating Center Residence Hall. Many believe the lady in white has never left her former home. The stories of Mary are legendary. We've heard stories over and over again from various students who have experienced the ghost of Mary, if you will, in our Keating Center, which has been a residence hall for 75 years almost. The hall's recurring resident has made her presence known to generations of students at Ringling. Well, I started Ringling in the fall of 1985, and I was a fine arts major and lived in the dorms, what's now Keating Hall. I noticed some funny things starting to happen in my room. I'd leave and turn the lights out, and when I come back on, the lights would be on. I had a scarf that was just sort of draped over a doorknob, and it was all of a sudden tied around the door one time. So just little kind of creepy things that I would notice that would, would make me a little bit nervous. But on one fateful night, Mary went from a playful prankster to a terrifying specter. I woke up and opened my eyes and there was this ghostly figure hovering in the far corner of my room. She closed her eyes hoping it was a dream, but when she opened them again, Mary was still there. And I said, Mary, go, you, know, you, don't, you don't live here, you're not welcome here. Mary vanished just as a concerned neighbor who heard screams ran in. And then I told her what had happened, and she said that she had, she had had encounters with her, too, in her room. Mary's hovering act has also made its way outside the walls of Keating. My friend and I, Todd, were talking and walking towards the Keating Hall. It was two in the morning, and the entire campus seemed dead to the world. But one resident was a little more dead than the rest. I stopped, and my friend wasn't paying attention to what was in the front. He was paying attention to me. And then he turned around and looked at me and said, what are you looking at? On the very top floor was a girl standing in the window. It didn't seem right, because the girl was dressed in more of an early 1900s, late 1800s long dress. But it was, wasn't quite right. Right before their eyes, the shadowy figure jumped. And we ran over to where the bushes were, to where she would have fallen, and there was nothing there. It was just, just an ominous, eerie sight. Is Mary's spirit teaching the students of Ringling a lesson in fear? Or is she simply a wayward soul too depressed to graduate to a place of even higher learning? For some, it's a terrifying visit from the other side. For others, it's just another part of the frightening and mysterious experience that is college. In the quaint town of South Hadley, Massachusetts, sits the nation's oldest continuing institution for higher learning for women. It's called Mount Holyoke College. And while today young women from all over the world are dying to get into this competitive liberal arts school, there are some who have died and can't get out. Founded by educator Mary Lyon in 1837, Mount Holyoke's 2,000 students continue to hold on to the traditions of its founder. From the athletic complex to our classrooms and student center, there's just, there's so much to rave about. It's just a great place to live and study. The traditions have stayed for so long, and there are so many because it was founded in 1837, and at that time it was the first women's college anywhere in the U.S., and they've just kept going with the whole sisterhood bond and keeping the community together. The all-women's atmosphere is incredible. It's, it's, it's an atmosphere unlike I've, I've ever experienced. It's, it's an intensely complex support network. But when it comes to ghosts at Mount Holyoke, students can't say they haven't been warned. I remember the very first orientation, they were like, okay, here you are, you're gonna hear ghost stories, there are lots of ghost stories. They were like, if you're scared, leave, you know, because like, these are scary ghost stories. Many of the ghost stories are attributed to the body buried in the center of campus. 
It is the grave of the college founder, Miss Mary Lyon. As a presence on campus, she is quite, uh, you know, present. She is absolutely here. Mary Lyon founded this school in 1837, and it, it was a labor of love. Mary Lyon was a huge advocate for women's higher education, and even today, all who say her name do so with a great appreciation of her efforts. But there was one person at Mount Holyoke who didn't share the admiration. Rumor has it that Mary Lyon and the school's religious clergyman, Deacon Porter, were having an illicit affair. Deacon Porter uh, was a good friend of Mary Lyon, and some would say perhaps too good of a friend. Today, a picture of the deacon's wife, Mrs. Hannah Porter, still hangs on campus. And some students swear the portrait is possessed. Hannah Porter's portrait is, in fact, um, very somber. And apparently, the look she takes on during finals time um, is very disapproving. Uh, many students perceive this as her, her final vengeance against Mary Lyon for the affair she perceived between our founder and Deacon Porter. But a creepy painting isn't the only remnant of the past that comes alive at Mount Holyoke. Mary Lyon herself makes her presence known. And while she isn't necessarily menacing, there is one spot on campus where students and staff don't like to go. I live on the fourth floor of Wilder. I would say it is haunted. What do you think? Definitely. Yes, it's really haunted. Students assigned to the fourth floor say they've seen firsthand that Mount Holyoke's ghost stories aren't stories at all. My roommate was asleep in her room, and I had just gone to bed in my room, and it was probably about 1.30 in the morning. And all of a sudden, I hear footsteps walking. So I think, okay, it's my roommate, Hannah. She's up, you know, walking around. I hear the footsteps come in my room, come over to my bed. I'm sleeping on my side with my eyes closed the entire time. So the footsteps come over, they stop at the edge of my bed, and I feel like somebody's just looking at me, just kind of check to see if I'm asleep or not. And I feel an arm come out and sort of like go to grab my arm. Was it Mary Lyon checking up on her students? Or was another of Mount Holyoke's many spirits reaching out from beyond? There are legends of a stressed out student committing suicide. They'll, they'll hear someone crying, saying, help me, and, or you'll see someone hanging underneath the bridge. And stories of a mysterious whispering woman. There's someone called the whispering woman. What she does is she calls at four and five in the morning and will just say, hello, 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 in this really freaky voice. One day I just received like six phone calls in the span of an hour. I was totally freaked out, so I'm calling the <laughs> public <laughs> safety. <laughs> like, somebody's calling me, and they're like, oh, it's the Whispering Woman. They're like, she's starting early this year. <laughs> There's even rumors of murder victims still seeking to tell their tales. The story that goes along with that is that there was a young woman who um, got locked in the closet and like tried to scratch her way out and ended up dying in this closet. But then there was also the feeling from the bathroom of that, you know, something horrible had happened in there. Sometimes when I'm brushing my teeth late at night, I can feel something disturbing around me. It's just really unpleasant. There are so many ghost stories at Mount Holyoke, it is hard to tell which ones are based in truth and which ones are just urban legend. But there's one ghost that even skeptical students can't deny. She's a foggy form roaming the fourth floor. Students believe this spirit is that of a former student who killed herself in a room after she was stood up by a boy. Today, the room where she hung herself is off limits to all. For a long time, it was reported that students who were rooming in the, the room had their legs broken routinely. Fact or fiction, no one wanted to take a chance. The room was boarded up. But when a housing crisis hit the college in the 80s, the dean contemplated reopening the room. But only after staying the night in it herself to prove the rumors were nothing more than urban legend. So she attempted to spend the night there to disprove the myth to the Mount Holyoke students because nobody was, wanted to live there. And um, as the story goes, she left in the middle of the night um, raving, seal it, seal it, rip down the walls. 
No one knows exactly what happened that night. The Dean never uttered a word. I'm sure you've heard the room in Wilder is closed off. So it still is closed off. I mean, maybe there's a problem. But it seems like at Mount Holyoke, when one room is boarded up, the ghost of the White Lady just moves to another. So this is a room where um, social functions are held to this day, and the woman in white frequently makes appearances at them. But even students who've never seen a ghost know that the supernatural is just part of the Mount Holyoke experience. In all honesty, I'd probably freak out and go to another room and maybe call like residential life and be like, my room's haunted, hon, we need to fix this. And while the late night moans and creaks echoing through the campus can be terrifying, at least students in this sleepy Massachusetts town have something to talk about the next day. Maybe we're more sensitive, more intuitive. I think that is definitely part of it. And we like to talk, giggle and scream. And at Mount Holyoke, telling stories is a way of keeping their rich tradition alive. And perhaps a way of accepting that at this school, the dead just might be walking among the living. It's exciting it in is a weird yeah. way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's kind of like a creepy movie. Freshman students at Ohio University found out that although everything looked innocent on the outside, on the inside, this college campus harbored a history of horror. According to the British Society for Psychical Research, the 13th most haunted place on Earth is Athens, Ohio. I think it's the combination of things here in Athens. You have strange things, ghosts, a poltergeist activity. The room with the 666, wait a minute, let me figure this out. Yeah, spooky cemetery. You throw in a crying angel, uh, a haunted mental health center, uh, residence halls that uh, have ghostly inhabitants walking the halls at night, and you end up with a pretty, pretty spooky but pretty special place. Uh, I can't name one person I know on, on campus, and I know quite a few people that haven't had some experience or know someone that's had an experience. <laughs> People started telling me, oh, you live in the haunted room in Wilson Hall. Lights, curling irons, radios, all would go on and off on their own. You can hear what sounds like marbles going across the ceiling. All this strange stuff started happening. Uh, things started flying around the room. You couldn't really even make out her face, but you could see through her. Sometimes we'd hear rattling inside. There was a distinct sound of somebody or something moving things around in the room that we had just come out of. I decided not to stay in my room anymore. I stayed with friends. I've met a couple people that have felt very uncomfortable here from the start and said that they will never ever set foot in Athens, Ohio again. You'll be surprised how many people call you and say, oh, you won't believe what's going on in our hall right now. This spook file is a collection of newspaper and eyewitness accounts of unexplained events in Athens. The spook file is the most heavily used item in our department. Yes, there are all kinds of unusual events and unexplained events that may be paranormal. And there are certainly a lot of unexplained events that uh, never end up with any resolution. Documents in the spook file reveal a disturbing link between five local cemeteries and the town of Athens. When these five cemeteries are connected, they form a pentagram around the city of Athens with the center of this being at the very center of campus. As you branch out, you begin to hit residence halls and other, the, the ridges, the mental health center, and you hit areas that, uh, that are just chock full, really, of, of ghost stories and of legends behind them. There are several reasons why there's so much stuff going on here, and I'm gonna explain a few. I decided to take people out into where it actually happens. Sometimes we see some stuff that we really just can't, can't explain away. In 1873, the Athens Lunatic Asylum opened its doors. The Ridges at Night is, a, I think, a horror movie waiting to happen. Part of me is really excited to go into the Ridges because it's an opportunity that not a lot of people have um, 
to be able to get in there and explore and see what we can find. And there's so many legends. So originally, when it opened its doors, uh, it was a big sign over the wrought iron facade was the Lunatic Asylum. Now, of course, it has this new name, The Ridges, to help describe, perhaps, its geographic look, a structure of 18 million bricks. And there on the top of this hill are these Victorian, uh, beautiful but very spooky, very unsettling buildings. When you imagine what a 19th century mental hospital would have looked like, this is it. There are some of the rooms you can look through and still see shackles on the wall where the inmates were, were shackled. Okay, now you're in the basement of building 18. Everything's connected by either the basements or tunnels, which you see the tunnel going through down at the end of it there. Oh, uh, look, at, look at this. New patients, records 1943, 1945, 46, 48. The asylum was a regular stop for a physician who conducted extreme medical procedures. He was known as Dr. Lobogamy. He would travel around the country in, in, in a station wagon and his little tools, you know, his, his ice picks. And this guy could do up to 20 lobotomies a day because it would only take 30, 40 seconds to run that ice pick through somebody's temple and spin it around a little bit and destroy their frontal lobes. And then off he'd go. In 1979, the asylum was closed. The patients were transferred, all but one. A woman disappeared. They searched the institution three times, couldn't find her anywhere. The family had missed her and inquired as to where she was. So they had made searches, and, and I guess they had made several searches, you know, like in two-week intervals, but they, they never found her. Sometimes you'll actually look up there and you'll see the window and they see something peering down upon them, uh, which obviously creeps anyone out. Many people report an apparition. And in this one window, you could just barely see a presence. I promise you, I know it sounds exaggerated, but you could tell there was something up there. Year after year after year of sightings of uh, the woman moving from room to room up through the windows. Yeah. We're going to see what's going on. Well, I thought he went over here. Oh, God. Bats are not fun. When the missing woman's body was eventually found, it had left a bizarre imprint. And she come over, possibly, to look out the window. Maybe to see somebody to yell for help. But she took her clothes off and folded them real neatly and stacked them in the window. And then she laid down here. It just feels, it feels yeah, like I got chills when I walked in here. In 1981, a student who touched the stain claimed the dead woman's spirit followed her back to her dorm room. One night she was asleep. She opened her eyes and saw a face floating level with her head. It was a woman's face. This, of course, this of course freaked her out greatly, really frightened her. No one heard anything for uh, three or four days. They went in to check on, on the student to see, to see what was wrong. She had killed herself in Wilson Hall. I just feel nothing followed me out. Coming up next, entering the suicide room. This is the student room. We're going in. We're going in. She's right here. She's standing right here. And later, this family has been chosen to brave a night in Haunted Castle. My name is David Olson, kind of a show-me kind of guy. <laughs> Kim Olson. Oh, I like adventure. Let's go, let's go. Katie Egger. I wake up every morning scared. Stop it. This is going to be so cool. I 
Athens is surrounded by cemeteries. All this strange stuff started happening. Uh, things started flying around the room. The Ridges at night is a, I think, a horror movie waiting to happen. And this guy could do up to 20 lobotomies a day. You could just barely see a presence. You could tell there was something up there. She had killed herself in Wilson Hall. <laughs> In 1981, a resident committed suicide after claiming to be haunted by a woman who died in the Athens Lunatic Asylum. A student on the fourth floor committed suicide and under strange circumstances. And ever since then, it has really held their reputation as the most haunted place on campus. Just do me a favor, everybody just sort of crouch down and, and uh, get a good hold of this grass, feel the ground. The ground you're feeling right now is Indian burial ground, sacred ground to Native Americans. So this has been a uh, holy gravesite for centuries. Um, if you guys are ready, we'll go ahead and uh, start heading into Wilson and see what we can come up with, see what we can find. You guys set? All right. Most people never get the chance to see what you guys are about to see. What we're gonna do is, again, we're right here at, at the gateway to Wilson. Uh, the most haunted room on campus is just four flights of stairs straight up. All right, let's head on up. Like I said, four flights right up here. Is, We've had several students with a lot of what I've heard referred to as like a psychic slap in the face, where you walk into a place and you're hit by something that makes your hair stand on end and, and puts you in a really uneasy, uneasy state. Creepy building. It's it is it is. You're absolutely right. Right here through this door is uh, is pretty much right where it happens. This is the hallway where uh, most of the ghostly activity is centered. You guys ready? Yeah. I said we've looked out. I've got the key. Uh, I got the key from the university to, to open the the door here. Uh, Come up here, and I'll show you guys something on the door, and then we'll we'll fill you in on the story a little bit more. This is the door where people say that sometimes you can see a, an outline of a demonic face take place, it's in the wood grain. Let's see if we can see it. It's a little, yeah, right here. See the eyes? Do you see it, Amy? Do you see it? Do you see it? Horns right here, the eyes. It's right there, right there. Here's the, here's the story. There was a student, she, uh, she was into practicing the black arts, whether it was uh, some sort of perverted witchcraft or, or demonic worship, we don't know. But very soon after she moved in, people on the floor began witnessing very strange phenomena. At night, they would hear chanting coming from within the room, chanting and strange guttural growling sounds. Books would fall off of bookshelves, uh, brushes would fly across the room, doors would slam themselves shut with no wind. Following that point, that night of terror where no one could sleep, they didn't hear from her again. Three or four days later, the RA, the resident assistant, became concerned and keyed into the room to find that she had committed suicide. But before she had done that, she had smeared symbols and words all over the walls in her own blood. After that, the university cleaned up the room and the students, uh, new students moved in the next year. But sure enough, they weren't in the room but a few days when things began to move. Doors would slam, drawers would open and shut. And right there on the wall, that red blood began to seep through coat after coat of paint. And that happened no matter how many times they painted it over. Eventually, no one would live in the room. So it was turned into a boiler room that we're going to see. We're going in, OK? We're going to go on in. OK. Come on in. Come on in. But if you come right over here, you can see where the wall was taken out. That's the wall that had the blood coming through it. The university, the only way to stop it was to completely destroy the, uh, another door slam. The only way to do it was to completely take out the wall. It was the only way to stop that from coming through. Can we go? Oh, it's just a board, it's a board, it's a board. Okay, all right, do you guys want to go? Do you want to get out of here? All right, let's go. All right, great. Yeah. Yeah, let's get, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's get out of here.
what happened? There was a knock on the door. Yes, on that one. Like a chain oh my god! Like that. Yeah, I'm breathing so hard right now. She's right here. She's standing right here. <laughs> she has some serious chills. All right. Outside. Okay. All right. Let's let's get the door open and get out of here. Uh, let's get the door open. All right. No. <laughs> No, we need to go. We need to go out this way. We need to go out here. That was not a jingle. That was a yeah. knock. That was a push. I didn't hear it. I was still that in the back. No, that was a. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I'm sweating. So. Yeah, I, my heart and my my heart is racing. That's the room. Well, that's the room at the end of the hall right there. You know, you hear stories about stuff that you know this room's creepy or whatever, and you show up and it's a room. But mm, that was. It's got something to it. No, yeah, that was that was definitely one of the the most chilling places I think I've ever been. New Hampshire is a postcard perfect New England town. But in Keene, things aren't always as they seem. Located in the southwest corner of the state, the city of Keene embodies small town living at its finest. It's like a quintessential New England town. The city is home to Keene State College. Much like the city itself, Keene State College is a friendly, tight-knit community. The campus is really nice because it's small enough, but it's big enough. You know everybody. Everybody knows everybody. It's kind of nice. A um, little over 5,000 kids. It's a good time. It really is. When they're not studying, Keene State students like to have a good time. Actually, Playboy called us the number one party school. Yes. So, or professional partiers, that's what Playboy called us. Our students have external influences on them for the first time, whether it's uh, mom and dad not looking over their shoulders or uh, new lives to lead. But our, our students are just like any other students anywhere else in the country. The students of Keene State College, however, might disagree. They say other students don't have to worry about pressures from the paranormal. I would say that there's some pretty restless spirits around campus. And I'm not really concretely you know, sure about what they are or what their business is, but I'm pretty sure that there's things going on here that aren't normal. The legends of ghosts at Keene State College have passed from one generation of students to the next. But it's the first-hand experiences that keep the stories of the dead alive. Basically, just chills, you know, all through my body, and like, it was so scary. When I was up there, a couple of the lights were flickering. <laughs> it's just, it's really dark. It's very creepy. Of all the spirits rumored to be enrolled at Keene State, there is one that everyone knows about. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. Harriet Huntress. We just call her Harriet now. Like, we just kind of are like, oh, it's just Harriet. The legend of Harriet Huntress dates back to the school's humble beginnings around the turn of the century. Harriet Huntress was, uh, was pretty special in the world of education. Uh, students were her focus. Uh, she uh, did whatever she could to make, uh, in particular, their quality of life better. Harriet worked for the Board of Education and was known as a devoted educator. She passionately fought for underprivileged students and raised funds so no student at Keene State College would be denied an education. The story goes that in 1918, she became afflicted with a mysterious illness and was bound to a wheelchair. But that didn't stop her tireless dedication to the school. Many say before she died, Harriet left a large sum of money to student scholarships. After her death, the school named a residence hall after Harriet. Huntress Hall sits on the Keene State Quad in the heart of the campus. And according to legend, Harriet's ghost has returned to Keene State, keeping a watchful eye on students who reside in her namesake hall. Huntress Hall had always been an all-female uh, dormitory, but during World War II, we started to have uh, naval air cadets coming in uh, to stay and to study while they were being trained at the airport outside of town. The all-female dorm was split in two to house the air cadets, 
They say that's when the problem started. We've been told many times that the uh, that the young ladies that lived in Huntress were uh, trying to get through the barriers to the men's side and vice versa. And when that happened, Harriet was upset. And the noises started. <laughs> According to students at Keene State, the noises haven't stopped. And most are traced back to the attic where Harriet's original wheelchair is kept. Soon after she died, it was put away for storage. But some say Harriet's spirit is still attached. And the dark corners of the attic are where she roams. One night I was just sitting in my room with my roommate and we heard like shuffling right above me actually and I turned around to look at her I was like did you hear that she's like yeah trying to calm her nerves she jokingly knocked on the ceiling as if to complain to her inconsiderate upstairs neighbors but all laughing stopped when something from the empty attic above knocked back and it wasn't an echo like we've done it before like I've done it since I mean and there's been no echo or anything and so we've been really scared ever since basically there are other strange sounds coming from the empty attic that keep students from getting a good night's sleep around like three o'clock um you'll hear it go back and forth um like you can hear the wheelchair going moving um like it sounds like wheels that's what it sounds like doesn't <laughs> it sounds it? Like it sounds like wheels like strolling over like just rolling down the aisle Is the ghost of Harriet Huntress eternally making sure her students stay in line? I don't know. I, I, I guess it's, I guess Harriet's still around for some unfinished business, I guess. The Harriet story is very well known, and I think that the, the stories aren't going to go away anytime soon. College students with uh, active young minds are fascinated by the unusual, whether they're uh, stories of aliens or ghosts or maybe just their science lessons. Could these active young minds be imagining the existence of Harriet? Or might her presence be one of those things that science cannot explain? While students at Keene State College have no scientific proof of a ghost, those who have seen her have no doubt she's there. Survive four years in a haunted college, and you'll leave school with more than just a diploma. All it takes is one extracurricular encounter to convince even the most bookish student that there's more to life and death than can be taught in a classroom. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment, and share to keep fascinating content coming here at Nightmare Nexus.